dear Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we ask that your word would be spoken with power and authority that would be real to us, Lord, that we would treasure it and, and take it with us, and that it would be a light within us that others may know that we've truly been in the presence of the Lord. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 And you may be seated. Now, I think what, what the, the best churches uh, that you will ever find out there are the ones that uh, everyone knows that they're sinners and they need to cross a Christ period. And it, it doesn't Amen. go any further than that. Amen. If you truly really understand that, then uh, you're, you're going to have a real church. Uh, unfortunately, people start adding religion to that and, and other things and dilute the cross. And, they, and, and really, it's, it's unknown. They, they don't realize what they're doing. Uh, in our quest for righteousness, we we so quickly dilute the efforts of Christ in, in, our, in pursuing in our own quest for eternal life or to be a better person or a better Christian. Christianity isn't being a better person. Christianity is serving Christ. And you have to understand that. Uh, Christianity is going out and living a life in a, in a world that you don't fit into. Uh, that's Christianity. And, uh, you know... If you understand that, you'll, you'll go a lot, long ways for the kingdom of God. Okay, religion, religion is something that you use to try to fit into the world and, and try to make yourself a better person and, and look better and talk better and act better. That, that isn't Christianity. Uh, Christianity is going out a sinner, always being a sinner, and standing up for the man who died for your sins and understanding that love and that everybody is created equal and they all deserve that same hope and love. And you go out with that. And uh, so that, that's what Christianity is. And that, that keeps the cross, the, the, the power of the cross first and foremost. And with that, we've uh, been talking about hell. And uh, how shall uh, ye escape the damnation of hell? A very important word there is that damnation of hell. Not hell itself, the damnation of and that's the worst part. The day, the, the, the moment uh, that you realize that you have been damned to hell. That you have made something else the Lord of your life. And that moment when Christ will literally uh, damn you to hell, it will be your one, only, and last time that you will ever see His face. That will be the worst hell that you will ever experience in your life. Okay? Now, you have to understand as we go through this, and, and I think this is the last one on hell, number nine. You know, the rich man, as he was burning in hell in the fires, it, you read that carefully, it says, and, and he looked up. He looked up. He did not see Christ. He did not see God. He was looking at Abraham holding the beggar. He was looking at the very greed and pride that made him hell. This rich man is drying up, and he is going to wait the day. That moment, when for his one and last and only time, he will behold the face of Jesus Christ. When that happens, he will be told that he is damned to hell. That is the worst moment of eternal damnation that that person will ever experience. That's why God says, seek my face now. Not later, now. Once you find that in the, the poor and the homeless and the needy and the needy, each other, you will always have that hope of knowing in that moment you look up, you will behold the face of Christ for eternity. And as much as you do it to the least of these, you've done it to me. That's what he was saying to Philip. Philip, if you see me, you see the Father. Look, Philip. My face looks like this. The poor, the needy, the homeless. If you go out and see that, you found eternal life, the cross. You found the mystery of God. That was that beggar that laid at the gate for that rich man. It was the face of Christ. He didn't want to see it. So therefore, he never did see it. But as he was in hell, mercy started crying out within him. And he was saying, go back and warn my brothers. Send him back. And he was still connected to that little good part that God put in him. Until that moment when he will look at the face of Christ and it will be over for him. He might say, but Lord, Lord, I professed your name. But Lord, Lord, you know, I knew Father Abraham. But Lord, Lord. And he's going to say, look, you signed 
the deed to Satan's property. Now go and enjoy it. So don't worry about going to hell. You need to worry about whether you sign the deed to hell's property. <laughs> That's what you need to worry about. See, a lot of people will just sit right down and, and you will literally take the pen and you will literally sign the deed to Satan's playground. Sure, it's a big world out there. Remember we were talking about it. There's a big fence around. It looks good out there, doesn't it? And you sign that, that deed. And some of you don't even know. You sell out your soul to Satan. How all through riches, through, through greed, through pride, through religion, through my way. Through, you know what? I'll serve God my way, not the way that Jesus said it should be done. Now, if there, the, the first, the very first flag, red flag, if you will. Maybe you want to call it a yellow flag. I don't care what color flag you use. But... The first thing you can do is you point out Matthew 25, 31 to 46 to somebody and then see how they react. Where Jesus said, I was hungry, you fed me, thirsty, you gave me a drink. And you talk to them and you see if they believe that that's the most important thing to do as a Christian. If they make light of that or they start swinging left or right of that, the flag should go up. You know, we want to take this Bible, you want to read it, and you want to try to read all this stuff into it. That's not what you're to do. You're to take out of it. And if you go to Matthew 25, 31 to 46, and you read it, you are reading a doctrine. You are reading a command. You are reading exactly what everyone's going to look at when they see the face of Christ and what he's going to do. If that doesn't mean anything to you, then you can look around and say, well, I understand why the world is in the hell that it's in. If that means something to you, and you truly know Christ as Lord and Savior, you should get mad inside. You should get upset. You should start understanding a little more where I come from and what I preach and what I stand for. Amen. If, if you understand that. Pressing and ignoring the poor. Now, uh, here's, here's an example. This has been bothering me so bad. I'm telling you something, people. They're going to they're gonna shoot me if I get out there. This is bothering me so bad. This example of hell. We've been talking about it. The gates are here. I was watching a, this TV commercial, and, and there was this young child dying of a disease. I want to say cancer, but I'm not 100% sure. It was cancer, but... Uh, it was a disease. I didn't catch that because when I heard the end part, it got me so furious inside that I just, my mind went blank. And the lady said this she, uh, about finding a cure for this child. She came out and said, science isn't the problem. It's the funding. Huh. Oh, man, I got furious. <laughs> so here's someone coming out and saying, look, it's not the problem finding a cure. It's getting the money. She basically came out and said, look, we have the capabilities of, uh, and technology to find cures here. We just don't have the money. And then here they're exploiting a little child on TV dying of a disease. And we got 800 and some billionaires in the United States alone. Doesn't that bother you? <laughs> People, that is hell if there ever was a definition of it. How you could come out on national TV and, and put a child dying of a disease and say, you know what? The problem isn't that we can't invent the cure. The problem is we can't get the funding to do it. That's disgusting. Okay. Doesn't that bother you? Yes. Now add on top of that that, that individuals go out and they make mistakes in their lives, whether it be some sort of, of crime, and then people attack that individual when they try to better their lives and move on because of what they've done, whether it be a child or, or someone else or whatever. But yet, we can come out and publicly say, look at this child died of a disease, and you know what? It's not science. It's not that we can't find a cure. It's that we don't have the money. Now, I want you to stop there and think for a moment. Can you imagine how many people in, in the United States 
throughout 24 hours are going to walk through the doors of the church. Now imagine all the gas money, all the gas money, all the lunches they're going to go out to, all that money coming into that church, and, they, and that's set on TV in 2012. Hey, it's not that science can't find a cure, it's there's no funding. And then they put a child on TV and show them dying. Man, I love that. That's what bothering me. That's a sad thing. See, only a very wicked and perverse generation could let that comment be made. Only a, a, only a moment in time in history when the love of many has waxed cold. When that is truly here, could that be made? Could somebody come out and do that? You know, and then what I'm doing is, is as I'm pondering this, and it's driving me, you know, to want to do something, I just don't know what I can do yet. And I got this new cell phone in my hand, and all this technology, and this thing is like talking to me and doing, you know, really making me mad, because it's like doing stuff that it shouldn't be doing, and telling me to do things that I don't want to do. <laughs> you know, and, and I'm here, because, and I'm thinking that, that we have the technology to do this, and I have this in the back of my mind, that they'll put a child on TV and say, you know what? It's not science is the problem, it's the funding. Huh. And I'm sitting here holding this device in my hand that I can talk to anybody all over the world within seconds. You know, I can, uh, you can get in and play games, I don't go to the games or anything, huh. I won't, but, but as I'm looking there, it's like all this stuff you can do. Can you imagine the money and time that went into those cell phones? And then they put a child on TV, and they say, well, it's not science. It's not that we can't invent a cure. We don't have the funding. But here, we'll give you the cell phone that you can do all kinds of amazing things to. Be happy. Leave me alone. <coughs> See, that's the kind of stuff that takes a, a Christian to, to even now. This is why this time is so dangerous. Those are the things that can consume your mind and get your mind off of this, what's really happening. Self-centered. We get so focused in self, then that's exactly what, what a corrupt, perverse government is doing. They want you so consumed in yourself that you don't pay attention to their corruption. That's hell. That's what Satan does, isn't it? Yes. What does Satan do to John in the book of Revelation when, when the harlot on the, uh, on the dragon, remember? That's all the beauties in the, of the, the world, and John started to admire it. See, that's how Satan does, smoke and, and mirrors, and he, and he comes in, and he sidetracks you. He gets you focused on that, so you don't pay attention to the poor, the homeless, and the needy. You don't pay attention to the basic principles of the gospel, the cross that Christ taught. That's hell, people. This is hell within the gates. Now, you've got to remember, we've been talking about this. How are you going to get out? That's the thing. How are you going to get out? Now, but then you can have, maybe, maybe you're not. Maybe you've signed the deed to Gehenna. Maybe you signed the deed to the garbage dump. Maybe it's all yours. Maybe that's what you really want. But Lord, Lord, we confess, and he's going to say, you know what? Sorry, your name's not on my deed, but I'll show you the deed you signed. You signed this one. It's called Satan's Playground, and you know what? I don't know you. Away with your soul. Matthew 16, 19. We talked about this before now, a few Sundays ago. Matthew 16, 19. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Now, this is the keys to the kingdom. Now, this, this is the keys to the gate, but not necessarily the gate. It's the keys to what? The kingdom. Alright? This isn't the keys to heaven. This is the keys to the kingdom. Now, the kingdom is everyone, a king comes in and you come into alliance with the king. You believe in the king's rules. You believe in the king's commandments. You live for the king. That's what Jesus is. You've got the keys to the kingdom. 
You have my gospel message. I am the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And in my Father is well pleased with how I live, what I've done, the will that I've shown you. You have the keys to that kingdom. That's the key, if you remember the sermon a long time ago. The, the key, it's, not, it's inside of you. It's that unseen uh, mystery of God, that key that opens up your eternal life with God. That's the key. It's his gospel. It's his life. It's what he said to Philip, if you see me, you've seen the Father. And the gospel, that's the key. You have the key to the kingdom, not the key to heaven. The key to the kingdom that you're walking in it. That's what the apostles went out to walk in. The keys to the kingdom, the love of Christ. to help the poor and the needy and they died doing it. It was hard to do because nobody wanted to do it. And that's the day that we are in right now. The keys to the kingdom. And that is the spiritual key that's going to open up the gates of hell when that time comes. That's how you're going to get out of the hell that we're in. See, Jesus split the curtain. Remember that? He split the curtain. We don't have to open that curtain ever again. We don't need a key to open up the curtain of the kingdom of God. Jesus opened that curtain when? On the cross. He split the curtain. Now, because of that one sacrifice, now and forever, we may go right into the presence of God because of the work of the cross. Because of the cross, we may now go and be with him forever. The curtain's open for us. Okay? So the gate isn't closed. Satan put his gate there. Why does Satan put his gate there? Because before anything was, Satan was created to be the high priest, the praise leader of God. He stood before the throne of God. He stood there. And he said, I will be above you. God threw him out. God closed the curtain. And he said, now no one will ever come before me again. And then Jesus comes along and sanctifies the altar, splits the curtain, the new covenant. Now, all men can come unto God because of that. But Satan comes back and he puts a gate. Now there's the chasm, a great gulf fixed. And he puts a gate around there. So, And he starts to say to everyone, look out there at how beautiful the world is. Remember, he took Jesus up on the mountain and said, I'll give me everything of the world. That's what he meant. All the Walmarts and all the material things and all the money and all the riches. Yeah, I'll get you so caught up you won't recognize all the homeless children in your schools and the poor out there wandering the streets. You'll just push them aside like, yeah, there's nothing we can do with them. Hmm. You'll ignore the fact that there's starving children all over the world dying every day that we're here. You'll just ignore it thinking, oh, somebody else will do something about it. It's perfectly acceptable in 2012. That's okay. That we can come on TV and, and literally say that, you know what, it's not that we can't make the cure. It's not that science it doesn't have the capabilities to do it. It's that we don't have the money. And then they exploit a child there dying. Can you imagine what God is going to say about that? Can you imagine that we have now come to a point where a life, it, uh, m the, the, whether a life is going to continue to live or not is based on if there's money? Wow. That, I mean, it's finally to that point. You know, and, and then what's really ironic, and I'm not saying that I believe one way or the other here, you know, I'm just throwing this out here, and... Uh, uh, you may remember the doctor's name, maybe not, that he was uh, arrested for helping people uh, die. He wanted to die. Oh, Dr. Gorky. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad you said it because I wasn't going to. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I knew you would. Remember, he was, and he was arrested for doing that, helping people die. All right, now, now come over here and say, but yet, you can come on TV and say, here's a dying child, and we know that we don't got the money to cure him. Huh? Huh? Think about that a little bit, world. I mean, we are so, now do you understand why Jesus is coming? He says, oh, the love of many wax cold, you hypocrites, you vipers, you stinks, you have no idea. This is why. Let's go right ahead. Keep moving God out of the nation. <clears throat> go ahead. Hey, the Bible tells us exactly what's going to happen, and it's coming. And you know what? This, this nation deserves it, so I really don't feel bad. I really don't. 
and uh, you know, people can go around and, and instead of getting out there and doing something about it and helping the poor and the needy and making a difference and getting in there, you know what the church should do? The church should storm those science labs. They should go through there as Christians and tell those those uh, uh, doctors and those chemists, etc., that they better get on the ball and they better start curing these children right now and quit worrying about the money and doing it in the name of Jesus Christ. Do you understand that? You know what? We need money. Yeah, we, we need money. We've got to have money. Matthew 16, starting at verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go <clears throat> unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And be raised again the third day. Very raised again the third day. I want you to notice something. That was the demonstration of Jesus having the keys, having the power to open the gates of hell. That's where he conquered it. Now, then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. And that's exactly what happened. Satan has stepped in front of Christ in this nation, in this world, and in many lives. And you begin to look at the things of man and not the things of God. You begin to make the cultures and beliefs and principles more important than the gospel to help people. Look what has happened. We don't know how to act anymore. We don't know what to do. Our system of laws and and policies and procedures has failed. It doesn't make sense. The only thing people care about anymore is a paycheck and a pension and retirement. That's it. They don't care about a human being. Do you realize that most criminals are going back to jail not because they committed a crime, because they violated the policies and procedures of parole and probation. Not because they committed a crime. That doesn't even make sense. Now here we are with, uh, you know, over 50 plus thousand inmates. And they don't know what to do. Now they're going to, now what? Well, let's take away parole probation. They don't care if that's the right thing. They want their paycheck. They want their, their retirement plan. They want their pension. They want a job. So the only way they can have a job is they have to violate people on parole probation. Whether it's right or wrong. And it's a vicious cycle that is, is falling apart. And man keeps going. And man keeps going and pushing God further and further away. Well, that's exactly what the Bible said. And that's Satan. It becomes an offense. That's why when you stand up for Jesus Christ, people always attack you. Anyone can go out and say, God, yeah, I'm going to go serve God, are you? What God is that? See, as soon as you put Jesus' name on it, look out. That's when you're going to get attacked. They don't care if you just say God. That's not too bad because they can make it any God they want. But you go out there and say you're serving Jesus Christ and what he does, now you're going to have more problems. It's really sad. It's really sad that, you know, one thing I, gotta, I can honestly say, and I praise God for the freedom to do so, that one thing, and I'm going to tell you that the, the, I think the greatest thing that I get to do is when I stand in that capital and I get to say the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Because you know that other people that come in there, ministers that have to open up the floors in prayer, aren't allowed to say the name of Jesus. They have to write down their prayer before they open up, uh, uh, say it in the capital. And if the name of Jesus is there, they have to take it out. Did you know that? No. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? They can use God, but not the name of Jesus. But don't ever let me open up prayer on any of the senators or the representatives' floor because I will be saying the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I'm not, I'm never like that. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, listen carefully, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. What happened on your cross? See, Jesus died for all your sins, all your sins, all your ugliness, all your failures. You pick that up, he said. You pick it up and follow me. 
Everybody wants to put it away, these self-righteous religious Christians. You think you can just put all your bad stuff away and come out and say, look at me, I'm a good little Christian now. No, Jesus says, you pick up your cross and you carry it with me. You are a sinner, you always will be a sinner, and you will be a sinner till the day you die. And I say differently. You pick up your cross and follow me. But now he didn't just say follow me, did he? He said, come after me. How many of you are going after him? There's not many. Many go around saying, I'm following him. Where are you following him to? You have no idea. You go after him. Where's he going to be? He's going to be out in those battlefields. He's going to be out there among the poor and the needy. Remember we talked about that up at the, the revival there. Remember the man at the pool, he couldn't get there? Where was Jesus at? He wasn't in the pool with the angels and stirring up the water where God is working. He was out walking among those who couldn't get there, among the hurt and the pain. He said, you've got to go after that. Where are you following him? We think because we get up in the morning and drive to church, we're following Jesus to church. We're following him. No, you're not. No. You're going through a man-made concept of religion. You go after it. You pick up your cross, if you're truly saved, like you should be, and you pick up your sin and your failures, and know it, and you know that's who you are, and then you go out and go after it, and you see others out there. You know what, do these young children have a cross? No. no. Ah, look at them. What, what do they have? No, and what's it gonna, who's going to go after them? I mean, really after them. Not, not go and send some food and uh, go two weeks and leave. That's a missionary vacation as far as I'm concerned. Who's going to go after them? Jesus went in and he healed. He changed lives. It wasn't just a temporary thing. It was permanent. And you mean to tell me in this hell that we live in and all the multi-million, now billionaires going into trillionaires, that we can't go in and change countries? Are you that naive of the Christian church to think that that's true? That is hell if there ever was one. Got that right. Now do you understand why Satan used Judas for 30 pieces of silver? Hmm. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. you got a whole life out there. That's what, Jesus, that's what Satan did to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, I'll give you that whole life out there. There it is. It's all yours. And you know what? You have the free will to go live it. You have the free will to go live it. That's what he said to Adam and Eve. God said to Adam and Eve, go, subdue the world. You, you have the free will. Here's your right to go live your life. The best thing some of you should have done in your life was never go to church. Stay away from church. Especially this one. <laughs> because Jesus said, look, for whosoever will save his life. Do you want to save that life? No. You take your walk up on top of the hill of Satan. That's what he wants you to do. Whatever time in your life that he entered your life and you knew right from wrong, he said, there you go, you can have it all. <laughs> There's your life right before you. Hey, you got a job, you got riches, you can go out and work, you can have everything you want. There's your life. Do you want it? Are you going to save it? Are you going to hold on to it? Is that more important to you? <clears throat> For whoever will save his life shall lose him. Is that what you're after? And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. <coughs> See, there's another life in all of that. And Jesus said, only a few find it. You look out over that world and you begin to lose your life. You know what that means? You begin to look around and know what you could have. Know what you can get. Know what you could actually work and find that's of the world. And you lose it. You don't want it. And in the meantime, you start seeking Him. You start going after Him out there. You start going into the hedges and the byways where others don't want to go. 
And I'm not talking about little little ministry trips into the homeless and helping one or two and then coming back and saying, wow, look at the good work we've done. I'm talking about going after people. You know what, people? Back at over ten years ago, I didn't just stand up and say I knew Jesus. I didn't just say I'm going to follow Jesus. I went after Jesus. You understand that? And here we are. I went after him. And that's what you need to do. He's not going to beg you to do it. He's not going to put a rope around your neck and drag you. He says, you either come after me, or you're not going to follow me. Now, how many of you are going after him? A lot of you are going after your own life. And here it is for you. Now watch. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? you got a life. Do you realize that? You have two lives. And the one is that whole world out there. That we were brought up as children and told you better get out there and get a job and go to work. Sure, that's all good. But we forget God. You go after riches, you go after money, you go after the house, you go after the car, you go after whatever it is you're told to go after. The drugs, the alcohol, and you go after it. You go after it. Oh, I like life. That's what I'm going to go. And Jesus says, no, you better watch it. You better lose that. Do you want to lose that life and go after me? We don't, do we? We weren't taught that. We just thought going to church was the right thing to do. No, no, did you read these verses? You can read it for yourself. You don't have to go by what He said, look, you better lose your life. If not, what about your soul? Now, we've been talking about the soul. I mean, seriously. Are you willing to jeopardize your soul? Because you weren't able to see the face of Christ out there in the world. I mean, really. And it, this is just the beginning of that. This is just the beginning of seeing the face of Christ. But are you willing to do that? You're going to gamble your, your very soul right now. This is what you're going to do. you got a whole life. I see so many people. All they worry about is everything in their life. I worry about my mistakes. I worry about, about this, that, and the other thing. And that's natural. We, we're going to do that. But do you want to lose it? Instead, right away, you think that, okay, I need to go out and get a job and start making money, and i got to start doing this, that, and the other thing in order to make all this stuff go away. And next thing you know, as soon as you get a little bit of money, it seems like everything goes away, doesn't it? Huh? It seems like everything goes away. And Satan says, very good. You just signed a deed to hell. That's great. So Jesus really isn't your Lord, is it? Money is. Huh? I mean, seriously. As soon as money comes into your life, wow. <coughs> Look out. It's all good. Get what I want. Now when the money's gone, what happens? All of a sudden, you cry out to God, help me, help me. You know, it doesn't have to be that way. Now, the first church, they come together, they brought all things together. They had all things common. Nobody had to worry. But they were doing something different than being done today. They were actually going out and going after Christ and helping people. They were bringing all things together to help the poor and the needy. Something you don't see too much. You know, the thing you gotta, you got to ask yourself is, let's go around to a lot of these agencies. Let's go around to a lot of these faith-based ministries. And then let's walk in and tell them, okay, your paychecks are no longer going to be here. You're doing this all, no money. How, do, how, how long do you think that they would last? Uh, they'd leave. It would last, would it? No, it wouldn't, it wouldn't last long. Well, See... That signature on that deed to, to Satan's playground, to that hell, you know, has a lot to do with that greed. It really does. But you don't think your God is so powerful that you could go out in the name of Christ and start helping people? Start standing up and speaking out that, you know what? When the day ever comes that science has the, the answers and has the cures, but they're waiting on money and they're going to let young children die because of it, you don't think that the voice of Christ out there would change that? I think it would. It won't only change. It's going to usher in the coming of Jesus Christ. There's no doubt about it. For what is...
is a man profited if he <clears throat> shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What are you going to give? What do you want to give in exchange for your soul? They're going to try. People are going to try. But Lord, Lord, I profess your name. No, not going to work. I cast out demons. No, not going to work. Not on my department. Now what about Satan's side? What are you going to give in exchange for your soul? How are you going to sell out to Satan? Judas was 30 pieces of silver. What about you? What's it going to be out there in the world that all of a sudden is going to sidetrack you and make you and, and become more important and truly going out there and helping the poor, the needy, and the homeless? Those people out there that you ignore every day, that you just pretend that they don't exist, but you call yourself a Christian. That's the Christianity is living that every day, you know, whether you like it or not. I'm sorry, but Jesus didn't just come out one day a week and go among the poor and needy. He lived with them, walked with them every single day. And so did the church. So what is it? I don't know the man, Peter said. Talk about selling out to Satan. How many times do you think as a Christian that you drive somewhere, maybe through a city or, or, or somewhere, and you, you pass these areas where homeless, drug use is horrible, and you keep right on going? Why? I don't know the man. You know why? Well, what are we going to do about it? What do you want to do about it? Nobody wants to stand up and speak against it. You know, down in Harrisburg, and we go walking over to the one building that's right, pretty much right in the center of Harrisburg, not too far from the Capitol. And as we were going there, there's a SWAT team or the police, whatever, in their body armor pounding on the door. Two guys in a vehicle and two guys outside, and one guy in bulletproof vest up at the door pounding, you know, making an arrest, you know. And, they're talking about making making an arrest. The, the guy's with me. Yep, looks like they're taking another one down today and they're talking on about it, you know. I'm walking here thinking, you know, that's the way it is. Why why isn't the church and the people coming in and sweeping those communities and really making a difference? <laughs> Why aren't they in there sweeping through there and getting rid of the drugs coming in? You mean to tell me in 2012 you can't? I don't believe that. Amen. It can be done. Yes, it can. But you know what it is? It's called the church 24-7 out there in those streets. But you know what happens then? You go out there in those streets and you start living for Christ like that. Then you're going to get these atheists and non-Christians coming out and complaining about that. Well, too bad. Then another regiment's got to come through and sweep them out of the road. You understand? That's what needs to be done. And you can't stop. Because people, look, that's not going to fix the problem. You know what it's going to do? It's going to usher in the coming of Christ. That's what it's going to do. What a ways we got to go. So much I could say about that. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of His Father with His angels, and then He shall reward every man according to His works. We've got to skip gears here a little bit, you know, switch gears, and skip over a little something. There's two things you have to understand. One is Matthew 25, 31 to 46, the judgment seat of Christ. That's where the goats and the sheep will be before Him. Okay? We know that to be true. That's verse 26. Okay? For what is, is a man prophet if he shall gain the world and lose his soul? Okay? That's the judgment, the damnation of hell. Okay? Now, what is known as the Thema Seat of Christ. Some of you may have watched that. That's the time when we will stand before Christ and we will receive our rewards. That's when you will lay your crowns before Him. 
there will be no, I did better than him, you did better. No, it's just a matter of acknowledging your works. This is where the Bible says your works will follow you. Works don't get you to heaven. Your works will follow you. So see, this is after. So it's the cross that gets you to heaven, but the works are there. So don't ever think that works aren't important. They have to be there. But it's not the works that get you to heaven. You understand that? It's the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. The sanctification of the Holy Ghost. Okay? It's the shedding of His blood, the communion. You understand that? That's what gets you to heaven. There's no other way. Alright? And Amen. that's where I stand. Now, what will follow you is what? The works. Those works are what? Manifestation of the life of Christ. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life, okay? And that's what that is. The way he walked the earth. The truth is within your heart, and the life is what will usher you into the kingdom of God, okay? So that is, the cross is the truth, and then the works is the life. But the cross is the reason you have eternal, everlasting life. But the works must be there. Now, what he is saying here, that this is what he will do, and he shall reward every man according to to his works, what he has done for him. That's after that. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste the death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now what you're going to see here is a transfiguration. When Peter, James, and John went up, Jesus appeared with Moses and Elijah. He appeared in his glory. Okay, that was his kingdom. All right? Now notice he said, coming in his kingdom. Now back, remember he said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Not of heaven, the kingdom. So he was saying to his disciples, you will not die until you see me in the kingdom. So now, remember in the Bible study, you have the throne of God and you have the two, all, all the branches. Okay, we've been talking about that. Moses and Elijah. So what was uh, he showing them? The kingdom of God. The whole Old and New Testament connection. And they would have known that through the, the prophecies of the coming of the Messiah. And that Jesus is glorified. The kingdom, alright, is what he was saying. You will not die until, notice what he says, until you, you will not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now his disciples got to see that. And others got to see that in his kingdom, in his power, okay? Now these disciples had an alliance, had an allegiance with the uh, Jesus, that they would go out and they would serve him, okay, as the king taught. That's why he's the king of kings and lord of lords, okay? So that's what they were talking about here as far as the kingdom. But notice what Jesus says back in these verses. you got to come after me. Deny himself, take up the cross, and follow. Okay? Those are all commands, and you can't get away from them. If you try to save that worldly life, you're going to lose it. You're going to lose your own soul. You're going to find it, you sign the deed of Satan's land. How then are you going to escape this damnation of hell? You know, people want to run around, and you want to say, I said the sinner's prayer, and no, it's good. You better truly have Christ as not only your Savior, but He better be Lord of your life. You know, you think about it, what shall a man give then for his soul? You know, that thief on the cross was hanging there. What did he have to give? He had one moment in his life to play a card. That was it. You put yourself there. You're dying with the Messiah. You have one chance, one opportunity. And he said, remember me. That was it. Remember me. You know what he was saying? Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's the publican. Remember the publican and the Pharisee goes into the temple. And the Pharisee starts praying and saying, I pray every day. <clears throat> I don't do anything wrong. I'm a good person. I go to church. I keep the commandments. And the publican, the sinner over there, all he did was he couldn't even look up to God. He bowed his head. He closed his eyes and he said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus said, which one was justified? It was him. That's what that thief did. Remember me, Lord. My cross is nothing but sin. I'm not worthy to be in your presence. 
but just remember me. Remember my soul. He said, today you'll be with me in paradise. How will you get out of this hell, people? Do you realize that in that moment, Jesus delivered that man out of the hell that he was already in? He didn't have to worry about going there. He was already in it. And so are we, whether you like it or not. You know what's really sad? Is we're not just in it. In many ways, we're helping to create it into a worse hell than it is already. And we are innocently doing it. Some of us are purposely doing it. We'll go out there and what will we do? Now listen carefully. You'll go out there and buy your cigarettes and your tobacco, your alcohol and your drugs, any other kind of food and, and pot and stuff you get out there that you don't really need. Yeah, you're out there building the world, aren't you? Making it worse of a hell than it already is. Why? You got a TV commercial that says, well, yeah, it's not that science can't do it. We don't have the money. Is any of that money going into all your, your uh, tobaccos and stuff out there going to help that? No. You're going to build the hell worse so, that, so somebody can come out on a commercial and say that. Yeah. And you're a part of it. All of us. Right. And it's getting worse. As far as I'm concerned, it's Satan's population control. And that's how corrupt that this world has come. They want people to die. And they know darn well that if they start curing diseases, there will be more people living, then they have to take care of them. And you know what? The rich people don't like that. It messes up their little utopia. It messes up their little world that they're creating so nice. And, and we don't want those indigent people, those sick people, to care for. They're nothing but a problem. Well, you just wait till Jesus comes back and has something to say about who's doing the problem. Amen. Amen. You know, a lot of these people out there in hell right now living in their riches, they don't realize how homeless they really are when the day comes, when they stand before God and He's going to say, Oh yeah? Welcome to homelessness. <laughs> Enjoy your damnation in hell. See, the lake of fire, people, this is what it's going to consist of. The lake of fire is going to consist of the purging of heaven and the earth. Jesus said the next time, I won't only shake the earth, I'm going to shake the heavens also. And he's going to purge the heavens and the earth like a great broom, like a great sickle. He's going to sweep hell away. That's going to be the lake of fire. What's that hell going to consist of? All the wicked, greedy hypocrites out there that walk this land and ignored a human being and made a human being less than an animal. God's creation with the Holy Spirit. Less than an animal. That's right. Yeah, that's going to be hell. I don't want to be part of that. Let's go to Revelation 1. <coughs> you know what we've turned into out there in the world? You know what people are... You know what the most important thing that people are being trained out in our colleges to do? To talk their way in and out and around everything. They're taught how to go out there. You don't have to have the answer. Here, you're just taught how to justify, rationalize it all away, and make it sound good, and you never have to face the truth. You know, it's really something that when you have somebody who is supposed to be in a position of of uh, helping to uh, design and invent, if you will, medications for the mentally ill, and they look at you and say, oh, we're hundreds of years behind in this. No, you're not. Mm -mm. You just don't have the money. That's what it is. You know what? I'm gonna, you know what? I truly believe this. You might not. I'll bet you right now. I'll bet you right now. The person, and, and you can put any kind of cancer there you want, whatever you want. I'll bet you right now, the person that could have the cure for cancer could either be right now sitting in a jail cell 
or laying in the streets homeless. Amen. I'm fine. And go out after that, you would see that miracle happen. You would see it. Hmm. There's something to think about. Oh, come on now. These disciples weren't educated. These disciples weren't. They were fishermen. They went and what would they do? Miracles. Yeah, they had the answer. So where are we going for the answer? Just because somebody went to Harvard or some, some you know, uh, college out there has a certain name, you know, we'll pay them millions of dollars to sit in a laboratory. They don't have the answer. They have a bunch of head knowledge. Go look for that. Seek and you will find. Go after me. Huh. Oh, man, I don't even go there. <laughs> it's just too much. <laughs> it's too much. It's just... I know a guy right now. I know a guy right now that he is, uh, uh, he's a uh, meth and crack addict. He will be all his life. A few years older than me, and that's all he knows. He's, a smart, he's one of the smartest people. I'm telling you. He, he, you know, like, he can, you know how some of the drugs and, and, and medical terms, you can never pronounce them, but you try, you know? He can just rattle right, he can book right out, rattle right off. He's, a, he's like a chemist. He can, he makes all these things. He just like, you know, well, that person's out there. That's what you're going to find your cure. Who's going to give that person a chance? No, who's going <laughs> to really go in there and try to do it and try to get the word out and try to pull that person out and give them a chance? How dare you? How dare you? Some criminal's going to come into my lab and start telling me what to do. You got to be educated. Huh. You got you got to know what you're doing. You know what? See, I believe in the miracles of God, Amen. Jesus Christ, not not a man. Okay, and and I don't believe those miracles will happen until the right <coughs> chemistry is in place. Okay, and that means the right people in the right place at the right time. And there's a lot more that we can do in this hell that we live in. Revelations 1, starting verse 12. Here's John. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the path with a golden girdle. His head and his hair was white like wool, as white as snow in his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet like undefined brass, as if they burned <clears throat> in a furnace. And his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. 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 And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand in the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars and the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks, which thou sawest, are the seven churches. Now this went out to the churches, but I want you to notice what Jesus hit on immediately. He didn't go anywhere but where. I have the keys to hell and death. He was saying to the church, look church, I have the way out of this hell for you that you're going to be in. Period. Not only hell, but of hell and death. 
Don't fear the one that can just kill the body. You fear the one that after the body is dead can destroy the soul in hell. He said, I have power not only of hell, but of the second death. You don't want to experience that. That's an eternal hell. The keys of hell. Now, think about that. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, remember in the furnace? Mm -hmm. Jesus was in there with them. Mm -hmm. I have the key of hell and of death. I can open those gates. Lazarus in the tomb? I can open those gates. Paul in the prisons? I can open those gates. A good one is Stephen. Look at Stephen being stoned. Jesus stood up, and what did he do? He opened the gates. How? There's a good example. How are those gates open? Stephen opened them with the keys of the kingdom. What did he say? Forgive them, Father, for what they've done. There's my Lord. And the gates opened. See, the gates of hell could not prevail against it. Stephen was going through a literal hell. Paul stood around there with a forked tongue hissing, still under the grips of Satan. And the rest were standing there as they were slowly stoning Stephen to death. Talk about hell. And what did he do? He looked up. And he said, I see my Lord. And he said the same thing Jesus said on the cross. Father, forgive them. He realized he was in hell. He realized that the Lord that he was serving, this is what he died for. This is what it was about. And a miracle took place. The gates of hell were opened up. And Stephen entered the throne of God. Amen. And then, the gates closed. <coughs> How are you going to get out? You know what Stephen used? The same thing that that thief on the cross did. He just said, Lord, remember me. Forgive them, I'm a sinner. Remember me. That's all Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was saying. <coughs> Go ahead. You throw us in that furnace. Our God will remember us. Samson, remember Samson? He killed over 3,000 people. They were stupid. <laughs> A lot of stupid people. You don't take Samson, cut his hair, blind him, and throw him down in a dungeon, and put him on a grinding stone, and forget about him. Hello. Because hair grows back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, it does. And in, this is what, in all of our stupidness. See, we think, listen, we think our government out there, Satan out there, the hell out there is so stupid and ignorant. They think that they've cut the hair of God and weakened them in this nation and this world. But they're forgetting something. The hair's grown back and God has a plan and he's coming back. Amen. And he's going to be stronger than ever. Hair grew back. And he said to the lad, Hey lad, you and they bring me up to sport this time. Put my hand, one on each pillar. And he did. And what did he do? <coughs> he looked up to God and he said, Remember me. And he collapsed the roof down on them. 3,000 people plus died. So did Samson. But what did he cry out to God? Remember <coughs> me. Can you do that? That's what you have to be able to do, people. Did you sign heaven's deed with the blood of Jesus? Did you really? You just don't go around professing it. You have to believe in your heart. You've got to fight for it. You've got to go after it. It's not a bunch of words. Or did you sign Satan's deed with the blood of others? See, that's what, that's what Satan's deed looks like. Going out there and living in a world and leaving disaster behind you and knowing it. 
thinking that money is the answer to everything. It's not. The government thinks that they're doing God a favor and doing a good deed by throwing people a little bit of money and calling it assistance. Is that what you really need? I mean, I mean, be honest with yourself. Yes, you need money to go buy something to eat. But is that really what you need to better your life? No. Is it? No. 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 You need God. So what do you want to do? Enable people to go out there and remain in a hopeless world? Here, we'll give you just enough money to get by and go out there and live wherever. We really don't care where you live. We've done our good deed. You won't be able to make it too far. Is that what you really need? Or, may, or do you really need, if you are a Christian, do you really need that church out there, that place out there, where you can go and grow and be who you want to be in the name of Jesus Christ and help others? Amen. And the church should be able to provide that anyone who truly wants to serve him would never be in need of anything. And money would never be Lord of your life. You would never need it. If the church would pull together. Oh well, that, that's uh, down the road a little bit there. So, what does that blood of hell look like, you might say? Well, just look around. You might say, what does it really look like? It looks like riches and greed, doesn't it? Oppression. Yeah, depression. Hopelessness. It looks like labeling somebody and then treating them like they're the modern day lepers of society. It's taking human beings and just pushing them around and discarding them. Not wanting them. It's literally letting... Children and people die of starvation and hunger and disease when they could cure them. You, you know what else is really bad? This is what it is. You know what hell looks like? That I just read about this, that oh, other religions right now, you know, they, they just uh, shoot seven-year-old girls. Uh, I read the article in the papers that they tie them to beds, and, to the bed, and then they train them to be like kamikazes. Yeah, and then they send them in their airplane. Yeah, they do this with uh, radical religions. Yeah, if they don't do things. You're literally like if the police in, in that country makes them mad, they'll take 16-year-old girls and under and take them out and shoot them in the head. And that's perfectly acceptable in 2012. Yeah. The one, the one girl was being, uh, a young girl was, uh, the same thing, was being mauled by this one religious person in this other country. And so she spit on him, so he shot her in the head. This is what's going on in your world, people. That's, the, that's what hell looks like. See, we ignore that. We, we really don't care. Well, you got your cigarettes to worry about, right? And you're a Christian. you got your tobacco to worry about, huh? You're going to go up there and worry about maybe somebody took my milk or stole my food. You know, who really cares? I don't see anybody in here starving. Maybe somebody moved your little container in the refrigerator. Too bad. Grow up. Amen. Hey, take a look around the world and see what it's really like out there. Maybe it's a little bit too cold in your room. Well, too bad. Go stay somewhere else. Amen. Amen. You know, you've got a lot of people out there. They, they have a blanket, maybe. You know what the homeless are doing right now? You'll see. Go on the Pittsburgh trip. You'll see some of those fellas coming through with six coats on, three hats, a bunch of gloves. Right, John? Yes, sir. And asking John, for right. more. Yeah, and asking for more. You want to complain about a room. Bunch of babies, stick the pacifier in your mouth and shut up. Amen. Amen. You know, seriously. Yeah, you can clap. Don't be afraid. <laughs> I could just imagine you go up to Jesus. Jesus, I'm cold. Bunch of babies. Baby <laughs> Jesus, I'm cold. Can you build a fire? <laughs> yeah. Well, seriously. <laughs> 
That's what hell looks like. Take a look around. Seriously. They don't know what to do. This world doesn't know what to do. They don't care. They only care about their money and riches. They signed a deed to hell. They signed a deed to this land, to this hell right here. This is more important than heaven. You need to understand that. Let's quickly go to Job. What I'm going to do is, uh, I'm going to point something out to you here. <clears throat> Job, you, you've got to read these verses today or later. Uh, Job 27. Okay? Job 27. Read this whole chapter uh, later. Very good. Read through it. Uh, very good. Uh, and exactly what this message is about. One verse, verse 8, I want to point out. Job 27, verse 8. Job 27, verse 8. For what is the hope of the hypocrite, though he has gained when God taketh away his soul? Read that whole chapter. But that's it. What gain is the hypocrite? You don't go out and live for the world. And you put God on the back shelf. That God is Jesus Christ, by the way. Amen. All right? Amen. You don't put him on the back shelf. Jesus Christ said, you love in my name, and you fulfill Matthew 25, 31 to 46. That's it. It's in the Bible. You can read it, and you better live for it. Period. That's, the cross is what gets you to heaven, but you better be doing the works of Jesus Christ, or you're going to be cast into hell. And don't ever forget that. Not by works are you saved. You're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ and the cross. Sanctification. Redemption of sin. But I'm going to tell you something. If you're truly saved, you're going to hear what's being said here. And you're going to want to go out and start helping the poor and the needy. And it should disgust you that there are people dying of starvation and disease in 2012. When it can be cured and it can be changed. And now, you're never going to end it now, world. Because all of us have failed. We've never fought the fight. We didn't get out there and do what we should have done for Jesus like we should have done. But in the efforts to do so, you will see the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> now you need to remember that. I want you to go to Genesis 25. <clears throat> Genesis 25. Verse 30. And Esau uh, said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he sware unto him. And he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage and lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. He sold his birthright over. What profit would it be for me? What profit is it? To me, to sign the deed of heaven and live for Christ. What gain is there for me to lose my life when there's so many good things I can have? Yeah, that's what it's like to serve Jesus. You start doubting and you start questioning. What's in it for me? No money? It's heartache and pain? It's dealing with people's heartache and pain. It's going among those people that nobody like and the world has stereotyped them. They aren't popular. What is it for me? What profit is this birthright of heaven to me? I'm getting hungry. I'm getting tired. I'm getting wore out. Feed me something good from the world, and I'll give this over to you. I'll give up the cause of Christ to feel better, to have riches, to have my tobacco, to have my cigarettes, to have my drugs, to have my alcohol, to have my home, to have all those riches out there. Sure, I'll give up my birthright to the kingdom. I'll sign your Satan, because it seems a lot better out there. Huh. Sure. Sure. Why would I want to walk those streets? You know what really disgusts me down in Harrisburg? Streets are filthy. Yes, they are. Just 
thought I'd say that. <laughs> you know what I'm thinking? That's what we should be doing down there. You know the first thought, if we do, if if God so chooses we get in that house, you know one of the first things that ministry is going to do? He's going to start cleaning up those streets. Amen. And there's Amen. no reason it can't be done. None. There's no reason at all that the church and the, the people in that ministry shouldn't be able to go out. If you get the city, get their heads where it should be, and think <laughs> it <laughs> right. <laughs> there's no reason. Why the ministry couldn't go in there, and I mean literally paint that town, paint that city, clean that up, and that should happen everywhere across the state. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We have the garbage bags and the sticks with the nails in them. Well, well there's a lot to be done. <laughs> there's no reason, none at all, that that couldn't be done. But you know, you're going to go buy this. They're not going to paint my building out front there. I don't believe in Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, then that's where we'll put the burn barrels right out in front of that. <laughs> Welcome to hell. <laughs> Hebrews 12, verse 14. Finish up. And again. Hebrews 12, verse 14 to 29. Read that later. I'm not going to read it all now. Read that later. Hebrews 12, 14 to 29. Watch verse 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. You've got to follow peace and holiness. Okay? You've got to pursue. You've got to go after. You've got to go after peace with all men, not the world's peace, my peace, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. See, the only thing that makes us holy is the sanctification of the Holy Ghost within us. So we got to go out and pursue all men with peace, everyone, equally, and accept them in the love and forgiveness of Christ, equally, or no man will see the Lord. You understand what I was saying at the beginning of this message? Here it is. No man will see the Lord, just like that rich man in hell. He will see the Lord only in the moment of damnation. And I hope no one, if not one of you here, ever, ever experienced that. Fifteen. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Now, Verse 16, lest there be any fornication or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. You know what that means? His self-desires. Is Esau going to be in hell? There is there one. Go ponder. It's one of those, you know, questions. Look what he did. He sold his birthright. He made something more important than his God. He sold it over. And that's what we do. That was venison stew. Oh, are you getting out of here? How are you getting out of here? Yeah, I haven't seen it coming. Uh, well, that's venison stew. The, uh, how are you going to get out of it? How are you going to get out of hell? How? Did you, did you sell your right? You see, if you sold your right to get out of hell, people, then you aren't out there living for Christ. You're holding on to your own life. Or are you truly giving up the life that you see out there for yourself? The life that Satan keeps flashing in front of you. The life out there that everybody keeps telling you, oh, you, you need to do this, or you need to do that. Do you, but you know deep in your heart that to serve Christ and do what you see here is the right thing to do. To help those in need. And you've got to fight for that, because as you fight for that, what happens? It seems like all the odds are against you, doesn't it? Well, then you know you're doing the right thing. Amen. Because I'm going to tell you that day, people. The only thing that's going to open up the, the gates of hell for you is going to be Christ, the cross, the life within your heart. It better be real. It better be sincere. And you better live for Him. Every day, 
not just on Sundays. The world looks good out there. The technology is starting to make it look a lot better. But you know what? All the colors and the flashing lights and, and all the wonderful little cell phones and computers and all the beautiful technology out there is just Satan leading us away from a carnage and a disaster that is laying behind in our cities, our towns, our jails, our hospitals, our mental health institutions. Oh yeah, these people, they're helping. But where's the church? Where's the true life of Christ? So many people are selling their birthright to a paycheck. So many people are signing Satan's uh, deed for a pension plan, a job. That's the only reason they're really doing what they're doing to help people. They aren't really doing it for Jesus Christ. There's one way to find out. Start doing it. That, that's why a lot of you in this ministry, that's why a lot of people in the jails and the prisons and, and coming out of the mental health units and the sick, you are the, you are the ones that can do that. You don't have jobs. You, aren't in that, you are in a position to literally serve and do this. Not that you don't need jobs. Jobs are good. I mean, you've got to have them. Don't get me wrong. But some of you are in a position to really make a difference. And that's what Jesus meant. Now you put it all together. you got to have some working, some not. The whole works. You put that all together, you're going to have a powerful church and ministry. And the day will come when the gates of hell will be open. How are you going to get out then? Are you going to be able to stand up to others out there in the world, other churches and other people, and know... That Christ has the key to hell and to death for you. And it's his life and what you're doing for him because of the cross that will open up those gates of hell. Do you really know that? Because if you do, when you leave here today, you better start looking around at the world around you. And start looking at how many people are walking around lost. And they truly aren't fighting for the effort of Christ. <coughs> You need to start seeing that. You need to start seeing the hell that's out there so you know what to stay away from. And then when you hear this message come across the land, I would highly suggest that you stand up for it. Because the only people that this message will do harm to is the hypocrites, the snakes, and the vipers that are out there that want to keep applying, uh, applying their corrupt ways of, of government and laws to benefit riches and, and personal gain. That's the only people that this message will hurt. And you know what? That does not make me sorry. Amen. And it doesn't upset me. Amen. Because this message will never hurt the poor, the needy, and the homeless. It will never hurt God's children that are looking for hope. And that's the difference. That's what will open up the gates of hell and usher the children into the kingdom of God. Read Matthew 25, 31 to 46, and you will see the truth. Let's pray. Dear Father, we just thank you for your message. Lord, we just ask that you would bless each and every one of our hearts with truth, guidance, and direction. And Lord, help us to see the hell that is formed over this nation and this world every day. And Lord, please call just a few of your chosen people to come together that they may truly serve you in these last times when things are getting so tough. Help us to be strong. Give us the wisdom to move on for you and be strong for you. And let us know that we have signed your heart, Lord, the deed of heaven, the kingdom of God, and those gates will be opened through the life of your Son, Jesus Christ, the love and forgiveness for all people. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.